<coughs> Good morning, and thanks to the organizers for asking um, me to present, and thanks to Chris for a sort of challenging uh, overview of where we currently uh, stand. So uh, it, for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the Centers for Mendelian Genomics. I thought I would start out with just uh, some interesting uh, commonalities and contrasts I see between uh, CMGs and COMPT. Then I'm going to tell you about where the CMGs stand right now, and then uh, finish up with just uh, a quick overview of the uh, burgeoning uh, collaborative uh, effort that we have going on. So um, I think that uh, the CMGs and the COMP programs have a shared objective, <coughs> and that's uh, at, uh, to annotate the human or the mammalian genome with one or more phenotypes for every gene in the genome. Essentially, it's a whole animal functional test uh, for every gene in the genome. Um, it assumes, this goal assumes that highly penetrant, likely rare in humans, variants can be found for the vast majority of genes. Now, uh, since these are rare, the search space has to be very large on the human side, so we have to look across really the world's population, and we have to be very uh, effective at identifying those uh, few rare individuals, you heard a lot about rare disease already, uh, who have some particular phenotype um, that uh, I always say to my residents, uh, Mother Nature is trying to tell you something, and you have to be smart enough to figure out what she's saying. Um, so it, it's basically this simple model. It's sort of the classic genotype, uh, phenotype model with a uh, gene, uh, and I'm talking largely about protein coding genes here, um, but uh, some perturbation in the gene leads to a perturbation in protein function, and in the intact organism, some phenotype. Uh, and it's this phenotype uh, or set of phenotypes that we want to uh, uh, obtain for every gene in the genome. Now, the CMGs and the COMPs have this common goal, I would say, but they have different approaches. And the approaches, I think, are complementary. First of all, in the CMGs, we start with the phenotypes. Uh, there's some exceptions to this, but for the vast majority of cases, uh, we collect individuals, as I say, from anywhere around the world, uh, and then have at it uh, with modern uh, genomic techniques and genetic techniques to try to figure out the variants and the genes responsible for these phenotypes. In COMP, of course, you're starting from the gene and uh, determining the phenotype as a consequence of a gross perturbation of the gene. And each of these approaches has their strengths and weaknesses. In COMP, I would say the strengths are that it's a bounded uh, scope. That is to say, you know roughly how many genes there are, and you're uh, well on your way, as we heard, to uh, making a knockout for every one of these genes. And I, I hope, I see no reason why you will not continue until you've done that very last one. So you have real focus uh, in the program. The weaknesses are uh, that, uh, for the most part, you're dealing with knockout alleles. Uh, and you, because of the sort of uh, pipeline and, and um, 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 uh, sort of production uh, approach to phenotyping, then you have to balance maybe all of the possible phenotypes you could measure versus those that are, you can put into your pipeline in an efficient uh, way. The CMGs, the strengths are, I would say, we see uh, individuals with alleles of all types at any given locus. Uh, tremendous uh, allelic series, um, and, and very often uh, different alleles have different uh, uh, consequences for the phenotype, so there's a lot to learn from that set of alleles. Uh, the weaknesses are that the individuals we study are rare, as we've already heard, and very often they're imperfectly phenotyped. That is to say, we get some patients that come into the CMGs that are very well phenotyped by some very interested investigator at a high-quality academic institution, uh, and somehow or another they have resources to do to support this uh, phenotyping. But more often than not, uh, we get uh, referrals from a healthcare provider in 
um, a third world country that doesn't have does not have the resources nor the aggregated uh, uh, group of experts to really uh, do as much phenotyping as we would like on these individuals. So uh, these are just the realities as I see them. Uh, the goal is a common goal, and uh, the realities uh, are that we sort of have uh, complementary uh, approaches and suggest that there's every reason for us to work together in this uh, common goal. Now, uh, let me turn to the centers, more detail about the Centers for Mendelian Genomics. Um, the goal of when they were formulated, we're now seven years into the project. Um, the goal was to identify all genes with high penetrant variants uh, linked and link those uh, variants to uh, phenotypes. And the strategies varied a little bit from CMG to CMG, but in general, uh, we recruit well phenotype probands, and that may be a single family with one or two affected individuals, or cohorts of uh, patients with a single uh, presumably homogeneous uh, phenotype from anywhere around the world. And then we uh, typically perform whole exome sequencing and more so now, uh, a little bit more so now, uh, whole genome sequencing on the relevant family members, that is family members picked to give us the greatest bang for the buck uh, in terms of uh, balancing sequencing costs to uh, information. And then we use uh, genetics, family relationships, allele frequency data, functional predictions, and so forth to try to sort through the long list of variants that we will obtain to figure out which variants are likely responsible for the phenotype that caused the person to be submitted. Uh, and then in the case of the CMGs, we return the information to the submitter, so it's a real uh, partnership between the CMG uh, centers and the submitters who can be anywhere around the world, as I've said. And uh, we then urge the submitter uh, to publish the results as quickly uh, as uh, possible because it's important that the work get out. We do increasingly now uh, have developed a good pipeline to post our results on the CMG uh, website so that uh, one can go and at least see that a particular gene has been tagged uh, with a particular variant that we think uh, causes uh, a particular phenotype. Down on the bottom are the symbols. The four centers are Broad, Johns Hopkins, and Baylor together, Baylor Hopkins, uh, the University of Washington, and Yale. So this is the way I think of the CMGs. Uh, we're looking at the entire uh, population of the world. Uh, and we're searching for patients uh, who have uh, rare and unexplained uh, phenotypes. So I sort of see it as each of these families represents almost like a colony of cells on a bacterial plate. And uh, each one uh, is an example of Mother Nature trying to tell us something. And each one then is both a challenge uh, to figure out what is being said uh, but also an opportunity to learn from this patient uh, something about biology and medicine and hopefully something that will be beneficial to the patient and their family going forward. So uh, we tend to keep score using OMIM, and Chris already mentioned some of this, but as of uh, early this morning, uh, OMIM lists about 8,500 uh, Mendelian phenotypes. There are th uh, 3,961 genes uh, which can cause a Mendelian phenotype, can house a variant that causes a Mendelian phenotype. Uh, those 3,961 genes explain 6,259 uh, phenotypes. As Chris mentioned, there are some genes which uh, have variants that cause two or more very discrete phenotypes so that a clinical geneticist would never have guessed a priori that they're due to mutations in the same gene. And lamin A really has, by my count, somewhere between 13 and 15 discrete phenotypes. So uh, some genes are really quite good at uh, uh, causing many different uh, phenotypes. The biology behind that is a very interesting question. Um, so that leaves us with at least uh, in OMIM roughly 2,000 plus uh, unexplained phenotypes. And as Chris also indicated, there's a steady influx into OMIM of new phenotypes. Increasingly, I might say, I don't have the numbers, but many of the new phenotypes coming in already come in with a gene. In the past, the phenotypes came in as a clinical description and a clinical paper. 
Uh, nowadays, they come in more often than not as a clinical description plus some uh, information about the genes and variants that are responsible. But the number's not, uh, the main thing I want to make in this point is that there's plenty of room for a new discovery, and uh, the number keeps going up uh, every year. So uh, before I give you the current state of the CMG results, let me uh, just be clear about some definitions. First of all, we use the term tier one to uh, mean uh, the, that situation where we are at least 95% confident that we have identified the variants and the gene responsible for the phenotype. And the evidence that we sort of use to get us to tier one are multiple families with the same phenotype and var rare variants in the same gene, or one fa family with variants in a candidate gene plus model organism data that recapitulates the phenotype and or robust mapping data and supportive functional data. Tier two uh, is when we're uh, quite confident but not as strongly confident as tier one, and very often that's a single family with a strong candidate based on variant frequency, gene function, pathway knowledge, and so forth. So you will see on the slides that follow a breakdown of our uh, discoveries in terms of tier one and tier two. The other term that will be coming up is what we call phenotypic expansion because many of the phenotypes that we deal with are rare. There may only be a handful of patients in the med medical literature. So if you have a set of three patients in the medical literature and the phenotypic features of those three patients are whatever, it's unlikely that you will have plumbed the depths of the phenotypic abnormalities associated with this disease. So you're as you find more patients, you find uh, more um, nuanced understanding of the phenotype, and we call that phenotypic expansion, discovery of features not previously known to be associated with a syndrome or disorder, and that happens over and over again. It's uh, a reason why a patient, we evaluate uh, submissions and we say this looks like something new. We do it and we find that it's not something new, it's an example of a known disease uh, with a known disease gene. Uh, and we didn't recognize it before we did the study because the phenotypic features didn't overlap perfectly with the phenotype that we already knew. You learn a lot of biology, but you don't find new disease genes. So uh, there's a review uh, 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 written by Jen Posey at Baylor um, that sort of sums up where the um, CMGs are currently. The paper has just recently, a few days ago, been accepted uh, and will come out soon, but these data are from Jen's paper um, and uh, represent uh, the first six years of the CMGs. As I said, we're right now in uh, year seven, Q3. Um, and so um, I, I only will point out a few things here. Let's see. Well, um, uh, at this point on the left-hand side, there's the pro it's a pretty big project. That all the CMGs together have nearly 60,000 samples from 22,000 families. A large number of collaborators around the world, more than 2,000 uh, coming from 82 company countries around the world. So it really is global in its reach. Having said that, there are major countries with huge um, numbers of population uh, that we have not touched at all. For example, China and India, uh, we really have not touched at all, uh, and not very much in Africa, uh, and better in South America, but not as much as one would like. Uh, we've studied in the middle 20, more than 2,000 phenotypes, and you can see the whole, whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing, and uh, on the Right-hand uh, set, uh, the publication number is up to uh, 465 with lots of offers, authors from lots of countries. So it really is reaching around the world. We're finding lots of phenotypes, and um, we're, we're making a dent in this problem. There are a couple of reviews. If you want to read about what we're doing, this one in American Journal of Human Genetics uh, in 2015, and then I said already mentioned the one by Jen Posey, which will be out shortly in genes in medicine, genetics in medicine. Uh, 
one of the things that the CMG centers have done uh, is invariably each center has developed some sort of database to keep track of their patients, to evaluate their patients, and they've modified it to some extent for their own uses. So uh, everything I'm saying is about all the CMGs, but in this case I'm going to show you a Baylor Hopkins uh, centric uh, database, which we call PhenoDB, uh, and it's where um, uh, the members of the Baylor Hopkins Center put their submitted cases. We currently have 7,573 submissions. The submission may be one family or it may be a cohort. So there are about uh, more than 10,000 uh, individ affected individuals in the database. Um, we've sequenced uh, currently around 9,600. Uh, and the VCF and Antivir files are in there. This database is searchable by all parameters, the phenotypic features, genes, variants, its interface with OMIM, Phenome Central, and lots of other stuff. So it's a very uh, useful database for us. It gives a chance for cases that come in through Baylor to be searched by Hopkins and uh, vice versa. Uh, we're now trying to, uh, the submitters have some say in how much of their data is available. We're now trying to make the data in PhenoDB more uh, accessible to the public, and we've recently instituted something called Variant Matcher, so that if you're interested in a particular variant in a particular gene, you can search PhenoDB and see if that variant has been recorded, and if so, whose uh, sample uh, has that variant, and you will get the email of that person, and then you can reach out to that person um, uh, with, uh, to see if you have some commonalities. Uh, there's also an educational instance of this database, which was created by Nada Subrea, where we took, she took uh, Ceph families, well-sequenced uh, Ceph families, and then spiked each Ceph family with a particular disease gene or variant n known to be an inherited in a certain way and so forth. So we give these uh, unknowns to medical students, and they work their way through PhenoDB like a computer game. Uh, it's a good way to attract their attention, and they learn a lot of genetics uh, doing this. Uh, and it, this, uh, it, we make PhenoDB and all of its varieties freely available. It's been downloaded by more than 450 centers. So if you're interested, let me know. It can be modified. might be useful for uh, various aspects of um, the comp project. Now, what are the CMG di uh, gene discovery rates uh, through six years? Um, in the left-hand panel uh, are what we call novel genes. These are genes that were not previously known to be disease genes. We currently have 1,252, and you can see the breakdown between tier 1 in blue and tier 2 in whatever that color is, um, and that makes up about 39 percent of our discoveries. Uh, known genes with phenotype, phenotype expansion, uh, about uh, 400. And uh, then known genes, that is known disease genes, we didn't recognize the phenotype and ran them through the process. Uh, there are about 1,550 genes in, in that uh, collection as well. So lots of new uh, uh, disease genes, lots of phenotypic expansion and so forth. This is a key slide. Um, the uh, the y-axis is the number of discoveries and the x-axis are the uh, years of the CMG project. The key uh, data are in the reddish columns, which are the cumulative novel disease gene discovery. And the point we want to make here is that the rate uh, seems to be uh, going up steadily. Uh, and currently it's running at about 200 novel discoveries per year and one novel discovery per about 30 whole exome sequences. Now this curve is sort of interesting, or this slope is interesting from a number of points. First of all, um, at the beginning of the project, people thought that there might be a very limited number uh, of Mendelian disorders and that we would get to that asymptote pretty quickly as we, uh, and uh, it would slope over as we finished harvesting the low-hanging fruit and really had hard work to do. So we don't see evidence of that. On the other hand, um, we've gotten a lot better at it. We have a lot more resources, a lot better technology. So it may be the fact that this curve is continuing up as some mix of uh, less low-hanging fruit and better technology, so we're able to keep up the rate. Uh, I, I, I think it's probably some of each, um, but I can't say for sure. 
Uh, the other thing is, obviously, I, I think you'll quickly realize that this prediction of 200 novel discoveries per year is going to take us a long time to tag every gene in the genome with a uh, phenotype. So uh, we need to get better at this. Um, and uh, there are uh, lots of uh, improvements, as I said, so it may well be that uh, this rate will pick up as we get better, particularly at uh, identifying patients with phenotypes uh, that need uh, explanation. Uh, one of the tools that's been very uh, helpful in gene identification, remember I said in a tier one category is to find multiple affected individuals with a similar phenotype and rare variants in the same gene. And uh, the same Nada Sabrea that I mentioned earlier and Ada Hamish at our place developed this uh, gene matcher program, uh, which uh, all a user has to do is register and enter genes of interest, or if you're a mouse geneticist, enter the human orthologs of the mouse genes, or if you're a fly geneticist or a fish geneticist, enter the human orthologs of those genes that you're interested in studying, and put those genes, enter those genes into gene matcher. You can also enter phenotypic features and other things, but you don't have to do that. You can just, all you have to do is put the, your gene of interest in there. And if anybody else around the world has said that they have an interest in that gene, you will each automatically get an email saying someone else is interested in this gene and here is their email. And you can then do with that match what you wish. Uh, we don't see the match. We get a, a readout of the number of matches, but we don't see the match per se. Um, so it's in that sense, uh, confidential. Uh, here are the data as of August 1st. There were 72,849 total matches. 9,487 genes were entered. Uh, there are about half of those genes have been matched. Uh, and so far there are 96 publications uh, citing uh, the value of gene matcher in making, uh, uh, making, catalyzing the ability to find a new family. So it's turning out to be very popular. It's used uh, around the world. Um, and it seems to be getting uh, uh, more and more valuable as uh, time goes on. Now, here's a lot of data from the CMGs on one slide. Uh, the bottom line is that all of these uh, different uh, parts of this slide uh, measure in some way uh, the transition of these research results to the clinic. So we heard from Chris uh, concern about the time it takes to take move molecular uh, discoveries to the clinic. I think this is going pretty quickly for the CMGs, um, uh, in large part because the clinical uh, whole exome sequencing labs use the known disease genes to help interpret their results very quickly. Uh, on the upper in panel A, it looks like there's some overlap there, I'm sorry, but in panel A, that's the number of molecular diagnoses for novel disease genes discovered by the CMGs uh, in the Baylor Diagnostic Clinic over the last a few years. In the, um, in the panel C below it are the percentage of the CMGs uh, discovered new, dis new uh, disease genes already in the gene test registry. So the vast majority of them are in the gene test registry. So it's been a pretty, pretty quick migration of these discoveries into clinically relevant databases to improve molecular diagnosis uh, going forward. Uh, obviously, this is an important um, uh, responsibility for the program. Now, the CMG is going forward. Uh, there's going to be lots of continued work on gene discovery. There's lots of new sequencing technologies that have, and, and so forth that I've listed here that may, each of the CMGs is testing various aspects of this out to try to improve their solution rate. Uh, we're learning a lot, in addition to gene discovery, we're learning a lot about mechanisms of Mendelian disease. It's not the simple uh, system that uh, Gregor Mendel described in 1865. Uh, it has a lot of similarities. He did a pretty good job, but um, a lot more uh, nuances. We need a lot more functional studies, and uh, this is one of the things that the Mouse Project uh, brings, uh, makes possible. And uh, we increasingly are interested in overlaps between the distribution of Mendelian phenotypes and Mendelian variants to uh, those variants causing comp common complex traits. So there's a lot to learn in that interface, that overlap. Now the CMG and JAK's, uh, CMG and COMP uh, collaboration uh, 
began roughly two years ago. Uh, I had I remember having lunch with Bob Brown and and Steve Murray, and um, uh, we all thought there was a clear win-win uh, uh, value for the CMGs. Uh, information about the mouse models really helps us. Uh, be confident in our discoveries, allows us to evaluate high quality tier two genes and pick out the one that really is the responsible gene. It also tells us, uh, gives us a resource for look at doing functional studies. Um, and for the, uh, the comp project, it helps you prioritize your long uh, gene list into those genes which are most uh, medically uh, relevant. And hopefully the back and forth over uh, phenotypic features of individuals with uh, variants in a particular gene helps enrich both of our studies in terms of understanding the consequences of uh, molecular variation. So we had a, uh, this discussion has led to last year a COMP CMG satellite meeting at ASHG in 2017. That was a very productive meeting. We all agreed to move forward. Uh, working groups were established and we've had mon monthly calls of, for two working groups since then. Uh, Steve Murray and his colleagues evaluated uh, the CMG Tier 1 and Tier 2 gene list, asking <coughs> which ones were already, had already been knocked out by COMP, which ones were in the, already in the COMP uh, pipelines, and which would be ones that would be uh, COMP had not yet touched and should be distributed among the COMP groups. Currently, I think there are 140 <coughs> uh, that were, uh, Steve, randomly divided between three comp centers list listed there for the knockout pipeline. Uh, the first mice of this collaboration are expected towards the end of this year, and obviously it will be ramping up thereafter. We've put in place uh, way mechanisms for the comp uh, group to see the uh, Tier 1 and Tier 2, CMG Tier 1 and two, Tier 2 gene lists as quickly as possible. That quickly as possible is our progress reports, which occur quarterly, or perhaps they're monthly, or perhaps they're weekly. I can't tell. It feels like they're weekly, but I guess they're quarterly. Um, uh, and then that data goes to the uh, CMG uh, Coordinating Center, at, uh, Tara Matisse and her colleagues at Rutgers. Um, and we're also now in the supplemental projects funded by it to various uh, comp groups talking about selected high-value uh, variants put in by gene editing for uh, specific alleles which we think will have interesting biology, interesting phenotypic consequences, uh, and be really high-value for um, uh, both of us. Um, so that is moving well. Uh, this um, CMG production list is visible to comp PIs on IMITS, um, both the public and private genes. The private genes are ones in which the submitter won't let us post it yet, and so we talk to the submitter and say, you oh, know, this is a really good thing. You better take advantage of it. Um, both Tier 1 and Tier 2, uh, along with where those genes stand in the mouse uh, pipeline, um, and uh, other um, bells and whistles are being added that make this, uh, I think, will make this platform quite valuable as we go forward. Uh, there's a CMG landing page that's been created with the features shown here um, and it shows the status for CMG uh, genes, where we stand with those. Uh, and this interesting table down at the bottom, I'm sure you can't really see that, but it, it sh uh, shows a phenotype overlap score between the OMIM um, uh, clinical features and the features in the knockout mouse. Um, and uh, there's the website down at the bottom. So uh, going forward, I think uh, we will continue to improve the informatic resources uh, for this collaboration. Uh, we need to improve, as we go forward, we need to improve communication between the comp centers and the relevant CMGs. I think as we begin to see mice, the CMG investigators are going to be uh, reaching out to the uh, relevant uh, comp investigators to talk about phenotypic features uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, a lot of this will be learned as we go. I, th I think we have good momentum now, but I expect it will be more and more uh, over the next year or two. And I think that uh, I think all of us would agree, all of us involved in this would agree that communication and uh, efficient data uh, sharing uh, are key to making this uh, 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 successful and optimizing its uh, uh, output. 
So with that, thanks for your attention, and uh, thanks also to my CMG colleagues, which I'll list there for you to see. Thank you.